I'm Michael Coffey. I have a family physician with a different North Shore, North Shore Physicians Group, I just north of Boston. And our group is uh, wrestling with meaningful use and, and when to begin. I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about stage two and either what's coming or uh, when we may hear an answer about when we'll know. So the process is that there's going to be, um, we got our recommendations in June from the Health IT Policy Committee for what meaningful use should look like. And we love our federal advisory committees because, you know, someone said, no matter how big or good your organization is, most of the smart people in the world don't work for you. But I would say we have a pretty good shot at the smartest people, the you know, wisest people being involved in some way with our FACA process in the country on this. It's amazing the advice we've got for them, but it also, the process itself helps get comment. We've had, I think, publicly broadcast hearings every other day for the past two years. Say that again every other day for the past two years. Some of you have been in far too many of them, and I apologize. But we listen very carefully to what our advisory committee says. And here's what our advisory committee said for stage two. They said, one, there should not be a disincentive for those organizations who want to be meaningful users in 2011. That for those folks who go in 2011, that they should have just like everybody else, a year or more after the final rules come out before they have to attest to stage two. They also said that this pushing back stage two for the 2011 group only allows us to maintain the slope of ambitious but achievable. That there are things we're not done yet with meaningful use. That if we work backwards from where we have to be in 2016, that we have to make progress on certain things. Certain things tightly tied to healthcare transformation. Certain things like electronic medication administration records for hospitals that closes the loop from ordering to dispensing for safety in hospitals. Things like secure messaging. Things like patient ability to get a copy uh, view and download a copy of their own records, have a list of care team members, shared care plans. Those are some of the key things that they've highlighted in each of those domains of patient-centered, safe, coordinated care. And we have a process. It's going to be a notice of proposed rulemaking later this year, early next year. I hope that by next summer we'll have another final rule for stage two. There's a process to go through. Nobody knows what it's going to look like because Really, nobody knows what it's going to look like. But what I can tell you is if the past is any indication for the future, it's going to be ambitious but achievable, and it's going to look a lot like what the policy committee recommendations said. It's not going to be identical, but there's going to be a lot of deference given to that results of that process. Orzal, Chantal Orzal at the American Hospital Association. Thanks so much. One of the, the people who've, who's been on almost every one of those calls every other day, <laughs> Chantal. Always entertaining. Um, I am very thankful to HHS for its emphasis on coordination of quality measures, particularly across all of the yes. programs that are coming out of health reform. Yes. And just uh, a comment and then also a question. Uh, my comment would be that alignment is not equal to overlap, and in fact, alignment often means consciously measuring in one program and not measuring in other programs. Uh, a key example of that would be readmission rates, where we have a very specific policy targeting readmission rates. Um, why would we then also include readmissions in other programs as well? Um, so that was the comment. My question is, as we hear HHS talking about this alignment of measures, we don't have much definition about the process that will be followed and ways in which the private sector can engage in that process to align and provide insight on what is measurable and what is not measurable. 
Um, I think you've probably heard from, from other sources, but as the leaders uh, get closer to meaningful use, the thing that's really problematic is in fact the quality measurement. So what is the process and what is the timeline uh, for getting to that alignment? Thanks. Great, um, great question. So the quality measurement piece is key. I'd want to understand better um, why we shouldn't have a scenario where if you're reporting a certain measure for one program, uh, hospital and patient quality safety, for example, why those same measures wouldn't be leveraged for, you know, report once, use many times, for example, for ACO. It seems a lot of the comments we've received has been that we should be reusing, not just, um, you know, being careful to avoid overlap, but actually having, um, reducing the burden on providers by having measures reported for one program also be useful for uh, other uh, other programs where there is not a legislative requirement to, to, to differ on that. So we'll follow up on, uh, on that. Um, there is, uh, fortunately, a um, series of, uh, I think the, there's a consensus-based organizations that are called out in the ACA to help us with harmonizing, and there are contracts that are, so we can't talk too much about the, the when we're in the contract action, but uh, there has to be, there has to be a robust process for engaging and harmonizing, uh, not just within the federal government, but also engaging with the private sector, not only because of the folks who are gonna be generating the quality measures uh, and, and being subject to um, the, 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 whatever the payment implications of those are gonna be, but also because we can't succeed unless private health plans and purchasers and payers also embrace the same priorities and alignment and harmonization that we're doing. So we don't have the situation where a healthcare provider is reporting 500 different measures for 50 different programs, that the same measures can be reused across. So I think it's essential to have that process, and there are specific things called out in the ACA around working with consensus-based organizations uh, to do that, which I expect um, will be used. But I will say it's really hard to coordinate with the external world if you don't have your own stuff together. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think what we're doing right now is uh, having a process, as you alluded to, to make sure that across programs within the federal government, uh, we understand how to standardize, how to harmonize, how to align, and how to consolidate. Hi, Carol Murdoch, Nashville, Tennessee. Has there been much discussion amongst um, federal agencies about critical access hospitals, community hospitals that um, cannot afford not just the software, but the network infrastructure that's required, and then ultimately just can't get there. And what's going to happen to them, uh, not only from the vendor, but just ongoing um, if they can't get there. Yeah, no, there's a, there, there's a uh, huge concern that, as we said, one of the roles for government is to make sure that the benefits of health IT are open to all. And all means all. It means urban centers, it means rural places where you have a, a critical access hospital, I heard, with the average IT staffing of 0.8 FTEs. Uh, it's pretty tough. Um, you know, six bed uh, hospital. And I think a lot of it is gonna have to be um, people helping each other. There are many examples we're hearing of uh, some critical access hospitals or networks of critical access hospitals statewide or not statewide, uh, people sharing services, hosting um, uh, a solution, then making it available over the internet for others. Uh, of course, it means they have to have broadband access, so we're working with FCC and USDA and Commerce on a, a focused effort to get broadband out to uh, healthcare providers in rural areas. We have supplemental grant funding we put out for our regional extension centers to be able to help specifically work with critical access hospitals. But I think we have to work with groups like the Rural Health Association, National Rural Health Association, with uh, the American Hospital Association and others to, um, to help provide uh, those on-ramps for, uh, for the critical access hospitals because every CAH trying to do it on their own, um, you know, it's gonna be very, very hard road ahead if we try to pursue that strategy.
Hey, Farzad, Art Glasgow, CIO, Duke University Health System. Hey, the uh, PCAST Working Group recently released their recommendation calling for a universal exchange language, and I was wondering if you could give us your thoughts as to the impact on MU2 and 3 and other programs like NHIN Direct. Um, we have, as I mentioned, our Health IT Policy Committee, Federal Advisory Committees, and Standards Committee. There's also the President as an indicator of how much importance he attaches to science and technology. Uh, there's the Presidential Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. They have a report that they put out uh, last December on December 8th on um, health IT. And it has been very influential in helping shape the dialogue around where is it that we want to be, where we want to have information that's routinely collected as a part of delivering care, not only helping with care coordination uh, for an individual care of the person, but also be able to be used to create a learning healthcare system where the, learning, the health system creates and uses knowledge um, as, as, as part of its uh, functioning. A core concept there, a core innovation there, which was inspired by really the internet world, is the idea that you should be able to take information and make sure that it maintains as much context as possible when it's removed from where it was originally generated. So it can be recreated, reassorted, and maintain as much of that information, not only that this was an LDL and the value was 98, but some of the metadata around that. Where was it done? What was the analyte that produced that? Because it may differ, it may be you know, recalled or whatever, um, but also was this done in what setting? What was the provenance of that? Who was the person that this applies to? What are the patient preferences and privacy preferences associated with that? And that metadata, if enduringly associated with that little atom of data, uh, could then um, be used much more flexibly in creating intelligence out of that uh, out of that information. So the first step on this, and again, this is you know eye on the prize, feet on the ground. The prize is clear, but where we're starting with is also clear. And we got a ton of feedback um, that you know to to kind of you can't go zero to hundred uh, in moving the healthcare system. So let's start, let's make progress. And we just got recommendations from our standards committee about uh, a starter set, basically a down payment on the metadata around providence, uh, around identity, and around patient preference. And we're going to uh, put out a uh, proposed rule for comment to see what the issues are around whether that could be integrated in, a, in some way uh, as part of uh, meaningful use, and we're going to test it. We're going to use states to test it. We're going to use some of our challenge grants, and we're going to get experience and gain knowledge about where these kinds of approaches have been tested, maybe at Duke, uh, to help inform our uh, NPRM in December or January. All right. We've, we've beaten you into submission. Please join me in thanking Dr. Mark.